Time, 5 a.m. Location, Luskentire Beach on Scotland's wild Atlantic coast. Weather, wet, very wet. The Hebrides, beautiful, tranquil. Oh, by God, it rains. And it's all part of the adventure. From wild camping in the Western Isles to kayaking off the Welsh coast. In this series, I'm traveling the very edges of Britain to find out just what makes our coastline so special. How often do you get to see a site like this? Wow. I'm meeting with people who share my passion for our shores. It's fresh air. It's freedom. Gathering stories of those who seek adventure. Oh, we're away now. This is silly. <laughs> and those who want to escape city life. It's lovely. You sit here and listen to the sea. It's just yeah. our special place. These are my tales from the great British coast. <laughs> Set off the far northwest corner of Scotland, the Outer Hebrides are a collection of wild and remote islands united by a distinct character and culture unlike anywhere else in the UK. I'm about to immerse myself in the Hebridean way of life on a coastline frequently battered and bruised by the wild and unpredictable Atlantic Ocean and its challenging climate. To reach the Outer Hebrides, I'm taking the three-hour ferry from Ullapool to the port of Stornoway. Over the next four days, I'll be making a 150-mile journey along the Hebridean coast, exploring the Isles of Lewis and Harris and North and South Uist, before reaching my final destination on the Isle of Barra. As we near the Western Isles, the wind is picking up. Don't get me wrong, there are many things I love about traveling around this area. I love the open space, that sense of freedom. But it does get windy, it's blowing a hooli today, and I guarantee I'm gonna get wet. But you know what, what makes me sick is when people come to Scotland and they went, oh, do you know, I went to Scotland and it was raining. Cause it was bloody raining. It's the northwest tip of Scotland, that's what happens. And it blows a gale, it's all part of the experience. Welcome to the Outer Hebrides. The coastline of the Isle of Lewis is dotted with clues to its ancient past. And for the first stop on my journey, I'm heading to the island's west coast for a very special trip back into Hebridean history. Over the years, the architecture in the Outer Hebrides has changed dramatically. New building methods and materials has meant the traditional stone houses with their thatched roofs have all but disappeared. But there is one place where you can still experience life as it used to be on these islands. And that is the village of Girannan. In a tiny cove of the Atlantic Ocean lies the remnants of a coastal community unlike any other. Girannan is home to some of the last traditional black houses left on the Isle of Lewis. Dating from the 17th century, generations of families lived and worked in these cottages, farming, peat cutting, and tweed weaving. Families shared these thatched cottages with their livestock, and the soot from the peat fire would cover the inside of the walls, hence Black House. These houses are the perfect design for the sometimes dramatic weather that would come rolling in from the Atlantic. The thick walls and the thatched roofs would have protected the families from the elements. And I guess once the peat fire was lit, it'd be nice and warm. The last crofters left Giranin village in 1974 and relocated to more modern housing. Due to their historic value, 
the black houses have since been restored inside and out. This one looks exactly as it did in the 50s. Here to meet me is Alec McClay, known as Berry, whose parents were local crofters. Oh, walking uphill here. Berry, how are you? I am fine myself. I'm, I'm well, you're standing on the top of a hill here. Oh, yes. Bit of a slope. It's a nice, cosy place, isn't it? It is. Yeah. I take it this is the bedroom, is it? It sure is. Right. And a beauty. Very comfortable. Why do you think that's comfortable? <laughs> that's like <laughs> granite berry. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh, the beds had roofs to catch any rain leaking through the ceiling, and the floor slanted to carry any rainwater to the bottom of the house. And how many would be sleeping in here? Probably four or six, maybe. Wow. They'd be all chucked in there. <laughs> right. I've heard there's a room with a loom. Most of the black houses had a weaving room attached. It was quite literally a cottage industry. And the famous Harris Tweed is still made here using traditional methods. Now, at a glance, it's not what you would call state-of-the-art, is it, Barry? How old is this fella? He's 76 years old. Whoa. What's it powered by? Coal? Steam? Uh, steam of my two legs. Oh, it's foot-powered. Very noisy. But you don't hear that for the first ten years. I'm sorry, what did you say? <laughs> you don't hear that for the first ten years. <laughs> Today, Harris Tweed is back in fashion, and in a big way. You can find it in everything from designer handbags to Nike trainers, and worn by everyone from royalty to pop stars. It's the only fabric in the world produced in commercial quantities by traditional methods. And only tweed woven by an islander in their home using pure virgin wool can be labelled Harris Tweed. Did you weave this this morning? Yes, yes. A couple of yards. A couple of yards? Did how how long does a couple of yards take? Probably about two and a half, three years. Would you mind me asking, how much would a couple of yards cost? Very expensive. If you were to buy a whole tweed, something like that, one. You're probably talking two and a half thousand. Aye. 30, 80 yards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So show me how the loom works. It's got to be a steady rhythm, yeah? Yeah. Okay, can I stop you there? So as you're moving the pedals, are these the shuttles moving the threads to and fro, yeah? Yeah, they're back and forth all the time. Right. Time for me to have a go. One, two, one, two. One, two. Oh. oh, sorry, I've jammed it. Oops. Looks like I might not be getting an invite back to gear running in a hurry. That was a horrible silence you just <laughs> made there. I just thought I'd ruined two and a half grand's worth of tweed. We'll, we'll send you the bill next week. <laughs> I've twaddled the tweed. <laughs> Take two. This could be oh, costly. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Now then, can I just say, I've woven a good two centimetres there. How much would that cost? 70 pence. Can I have it, please? <laughs> <laughs> A hundred years ago, life in this coastal village set against the stormy Atlantic Ocean must have been brutal and at times unbearable. But it was in these very black houses that a Hebridean success story was born. The story of how the humble Harris Tweed became one of the most fashionable and sought after fabrics in the world. Day two. The often demanding climate of the Hebridean coast has created a character of resilience in its people. If any evidence were needed, 
you only have to watch the Highland Games, the ultimate demonstration of grit and determination. The games have been recorded as far back as the 11th century and are played out each summer against a stunning backdrop of hills and coastline. And legend has it that clan chieftains would go to the Highland Games to choose their bodyguards from the fittest fighters. So today I'm off to see if I can cut the mustard in a sport that requires strength, stamina and a stick. I'm heading to Dalbeg Beach, just outside Carloway. It's the training ground of Ranald Fraser, a champion in the ancient Highland sport of Madalesque. Dear Lord, look at the size of him. He's built like a brick Hebridean smokehouse. If I was a clan chieftain, I'd choose him for me bodyguard. Ronald Fraser, Robson Green, pleasure to meet you. Very nice to meet you. How's it going? It's very, very, it's going very well on this wonderful, Good. hot, sweltering day in the Hebrides. A lovely day, yeah. Now then, I've never, ever heard of Majeles. Yeah. Where did it come from? Why are you involved in it? Well, it's a sport that's unique to the Hebrides, Lewis in particular. Right. It translates into English, the lazy stick, which is here. The lazy stick? The lazy stick, uh -huh. and it's a game, a challenge between two opponents where they're both on the ground and they fight for the stick. <laughs> really? Yes. Is there any punches thrown, kicks no, thrown? No, no, just uh, aggression and pulling. So where did it all start? What's the genesis of it? I don't think anybody actually knows where it started from. It's a game that's really only been practised probably in the west coast of Scotland, the Highlands and Islands. The rules are simple. Two competitors sit down with their feet together and whoever can pull the stick from the other's grasp or who raises the other off the ground is the winner. And what qualities do you need to be good at the Magilesque? Strong, heavy, and a good balance. It's nice knowing you. <laughs> See you. Yeah. Strong, three things I haven't got, mate. <laughs> Look at me. If we have Magilesque competition, yeah. I think you're going to win. I do never know about that. A design has to have a lot to do with it. It does slightly, but there are certain things you can do. If you don't have the weight or the height, you can manipulate the grip. Right. Uh, you can hold your opponent down for uh, a minute or so, tire them out, nice. then you pull them away. Right. So there's various te techniques and tactics, yeah. Before our Madalesque face-off, we're warming up with another ancient Highland sport, the stone putt. Wow. Voila. <laughs> I was thinking high, but the mind, body and soul thought low. <laughs> The time has come. My moment to try and summon up that Hebridean grit. I think today you might have met your match. And if this sea breeze gets up, you might just find out what a Geordie wears under his kilt. It's a bit drafty. Remember, Robson, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. Think David and Goliath. On three, one, two, three, go. Uh. 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 I'm all right, I'm all right. All right, it's best of three, it's best of three. One, two, three, go. Uh. Ranold may be the favourite, but I tell you, you write Robson Green off at your peril. Yeah. Oh, now I've got you. Now I've got you. Here we go. Oh, here I go. Oh. Ah. God, man. Ranold may have defeated me. Annihilated me, in fact. But I'm not downhearted. What can I say? I hope you enjoyed it. I, I, I use the word enjoyed loosely. <laughs> Keep doing it, Bonnie lad. If you live on a remote island surrounded by stormy seas, it's bound to instill a certain toughness in you. In fact, everything on these shores has been influenced by the need to survive in this challenging climate. 
Like along much of the British coastline in the 18th century, the main industry here was fishing. But it took a very special kind of vessel to cope with the extreme Atlantic weather. That vessel was the Score, a traditional boat unique to the Isle of Lewis and Harris. Once, Stonaway Harbour was filled with vast fleets of scores, but now only one remains. The Jubilee has been painstakingly restored and lovingly cared for by Ian Stephen and his son, Sean. How are we doing, fellas? All right. I want to find out exactly how this ancient fishing boat copes with one of Britain's most challenging stretches of coast. Just how old is the Jubilee? What would she have been used for? Jubilee was built in 1935, but the design is much older than that. It's a boat that was developed over generations for a tricky set of circumstances. Mm. Fishing offshore in an amazing mixture of current. We're right on the edge uh, of the Atlantic here and get big swells and this boat just lifts with them. So she's wide at the stern and quite fine at the bow. And when the swells come over, she, she rides over rather than going through. Right. <laughs> We're sailing out of Stornoway Harbour, heading south along the Lewis coast. The conditions so far today are calm, but the one predictable thing about Hebridean weather is its unpredictability. First job is to hoist the sail. Sean is holding this piece here, which is called a traveller. The stick will get hooked onto that. Right, Maybe Robson, you... I need you here. When you're ready, boys, let's have a bit of cloth. All right, so we just hand over hand this. That's it. Great. So far, so good. We're just missing one vital ingredient, the wind. Bizarre breeze. Oh, strange. I think it's just a lull and it's changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah but changing. I mean, we are shielded here. No, I've seen the flags flying. It's going to pick up. Sean runs an outdoor adventures company, while Dad Ian is an author and a poet but it's their love of the sea that unites them. So where did your love of sailing come from? Was it in the blood, was it passed down oh, from yeah. Dad? Oh, yeah, I can remember being in boats that are not dissimilar to this before I can remember being in a car. Dad's an absolute boat obsessive, so we were always out, multiple times a week, fishing, sailing, yeah. Wow. I have to ask, has there been raised voices on board? I wouldn't say we've had raised voices on board. We've had differences of opinion that have taken time to work out. <laughs> <laughs> you ever thought of going into politics? After half an hour, we're barely out of the harbour, but as if from nowhere, the wind suddenly picks up. We've got a wind shift. Let's go sailing, lads. In fact, it's so strong, there's now too much sail out, and we'll need to haul it in to keep the boat upright. Are you going up to the next line? We are, yeah. Oh, bloody hell. All right. Oof. Well done, lads. It was iron flat 20 seconds ago. Oh, we're away now. This is silly. <laughs> now we're moving. That's incredible. There was nothing. Skiffs are designed to be steady and stable when traveling at speed through high surf, making it an exciting craft to sail. but catch the gusts wrong and you can be flipped over. Hence the saying, sailing too close to the wind. Gotta get that sheet in a little bit. This type of sailing is raw and unforgiving and in the 19th century, far out at sea, incredibly dangerous. And in the old days, what would be the method of fishing? Boats of this size and its bigger cousins would set miles of great lines, hooks the size of your fist, hundreds of them. And they'd be pulling in quality cod and ling. And as the weight of the fish came in, the ballast stones would be jettisoned. Of course. You know, when you're on a vessel like the Jubilee, you really are taking a step back in time. And she serves as a reminder of Maybe it's a much simpler era. The score is the beautiful answer to the question of how best to sail and fish along this most unpredictable of coastlines. 
and for Ian, these boats are a living part of Hebridean history. You've got something that was developed as part of the way of life. It's achieved a form which is a really clever answer to a set of problems. So I think in its own right, it's worth preserving. Within Scotland's Western Isles, you can find more than 6,000 sea locks. With their underwater reefs and sheltered shores, they're the perfect habitat for some incredible marine mammals. From otters and Atlantic grey seals to harbour porpoises. A vital part of this precious ecosystem is a type of seaweed that's designed to thrive in the often stormy Hebridean waters, kelp. To find out more, I've come to Loch Eresort, halfway between Stornoway and Tarbet, to meet diver Lewis Mackenzie. There he is. Morning. Morning to you, Lewis. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. On this blistering hot day. It's Another a, sunshiny day. A balmy, balmy summer's day. Loch Eresort is an eight mile long sea inlet, one of the largest on Lewis. So it's a sea lock. So sea when lock, does yeah. a lock become the sea and vice versa? Well, the sea locks in the Hebrides, they cut quite a bit inland, but it's salt water. As you go further inland, they are getting mixed with the water coming down from all the rivers, from the salmon rivers. So what happens is you get a mix of fresh and salt water, and the fresh water that flows in from the rivers sits on top of the salt water. These shores are home to five different kinds of sea kelp. Harvesting it was once big business on the Hebrides, and it was used for everything from fertilizer and clothing dye to making soap and glass. The industry declined in the 19th century, but here on the coast of Lewis, it's recently made a comeback in a very different way. I harvest sugar kelp because of a gin that's made in Harris, and the gin is flavoured with the sugar kelp. A gin? What, gin. a drink? Yep. Really? To give that salty, sweet aftertaste and make the gin quite unique. Seaweed in gin? I've never heard the likes. Yep. That's yep. marvellous. The highlands and islands of Scotland are famous for their whisky, but now gin is enjoying a revival. It takes only a teaspoon of sea kelp to flavour dozens of bottles of gin. The kelp is extracted by hand from underwater forests before being dried and infused into spirit at Harris's community distillery. What does sugar kelp look like? Because I've got a feeling there are other vegetation down there. It's quite long. It can grow to so about three, four metres long. It's got an undulating leaf on the outside edge. Right. And the middle bit is dimpled. Uh, I know what I'm looking for. Yeah. OK, three metres long, an undulating leaf and dimples on the middle bit. That shouldn't be too tricky. Bingo! One big bunch of sugar kelp coming up. Is that it? No. That's not sugar kelp. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. It's laminaria. That's laminaria. But I brought that up to show you what laminaria looks like. It's almost, but not quite. I guess it's harder than it looks. As the name suggests, sugar kelp has a sweet taste. It's popular in Japanese cooking and packed with vitamins. Let's hope I've got the right stuff this time. You got it. That's your first bit of Hebridean sugar kill. <laughs> so this is what the fuss is all about. Sugar kill. Yeah. So that's a young plant. That's about a year old. Can you eat it in this state? You can, no? Yeah. Well, I do hope it tastes better than it looks. So you get the salty bit first, and then you really? get the kind of vegetable-y. Yeah. And then you get a wee sweetness when you finish. 
I've got all three things there. I've got the sweetness just at the end there. Yeah. I don't need too much at the moment. Why is that? Um, I'm just hang off it a wee bit. It's full of uh, mannitol, which is a form of sugar, and also has a laxative effect. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Otherwise, me and the porcelain telephone, i.e. the toilet, would become very friendly. <laughs> It's time to take the fruits of our labour back to the shore, but on the way, Lewis has promised me a rare Hebridean experience. Watching Britain's largest bird of prey hunt fish on the loch. We're going in search of the white-tailed seagull. So at one time, there was an abundance of these eagles, and then they disappeared. Why was that? Yeah, well, the Victorians had a bit of a preference to get them stuffed. Uh, I thought they'd have something um, to do with it. So um, they were short. I think the last one was short in 1920. Uh, and that was semi extinct obviously, in Britain till 1975, when four birds were taken in intentionally from Norway. Was it a so, simple case of just bringing pairs over and letting them yeah, free? Yeah, two pairs, and they were basically let loose on the Isle of Rum, on the Inner Hebrides and they've bred and spread naturally. There's only about 44 breeding pairs of these birds in the whole of Britain. There he is. Uh, it? That's a buzzard, I think. The eagles eat them, no bother. <laughs> Half an hour later, it appears we're in luck. I'm actually seeing the bird. You can see it? Yeah, I can see the bird. You can see his cream chest, cream head. Oh, yeah. He's, uh, I think that's him there, just in amongst, at the bottom of I see him. Looking straight at us. Here he comes. These beautiful birds have an impressive eight-foot wingspan. Wow, look at that. How often do you get to see a sight like this? So watch for the legs going down. <laughs> wow. And that looks amazing. That's him, he's got the fish. And the hoodie crow chasing him. Wow. Fantastic, eh? Isn't that a beautiful sight? You know, the likelihood of seeing a, a white-tailed sea eagle wasn't in our favour today. Lewis was, was quietly confident with seeing one. And then just out of nowhere, he appeared. Silent, graceful swooped down, I don't know what speed, but it was fast. And just in one beautiful ballet-like movement, and deadly at the same time, just picked the fish out of the water and just took off. Amazing. From the heart of the Hebrides, this is IOS FM. When I wake up, well, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who wakes up next to you. It's been a memorable day on the Isle of Lewis, and to cap it off, I'm travelling from Loch Eresort to Luskentire in search of a beach that many claim is the finest on the British coast. I'm gonna be the man who gets drunk next to you. And if I heave up, well, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who's heavering to you. Well, I That's beautiful. There are many things I like about traveling around Scotland, and one of them is this light. It's like nowhere else in Britain. In the film game, we call this light the, the magic hour. And just look at the way it's reflecting on the water. This would be a cinematographer's dream. You know, I've been privileged and lucky enough to travel to some extraordinary countries around the world, and I've been on some spectacular beaches, and this one here at Luskentire is up there with the best of them. Look at the colour of that sea.
Here I am, surrounded by the most idyllic and extraordinary dramatic landscape. And there's no one else here but me. The Gulf Stream current on the western side of the Outer Hebrides gives this coastline an unusually warm climate for the UK. It's why Luskantyre appears almost tropical, with its pristine turquoise sea and white sandy beach. It may be mild, but you know what they say. In the Hebrides, there's two kinds of weather. It's either raining or it's about to rain. Who knows what I'll wake up to tomorrow, but for now, I'll just enjoy the moment. The British coast really doesn't get much better than this. Day three on the Outer Hebrides. On a fine day, this white shell beach could be mistaken for the Caribbean. But this morning, the weather is unmistakably Scottish. You want to know how well I slept through the night? Take a wild guess. The Hebrides. Beautiful. Tranquil. But by God, it rains. Oh, that's better. That's a lot better. Today, I'm catching a ferry from the Isle of Harris to North Uist, and I've decided to switch to a new mode of transport. I'm told the best way to travel around these islands is by bike. Especially if you want to get off the beaten track. I hope it's all downhill. In contrast to the mountains of Lewis and Harris, this is a much flatter landscape. And with more than 100 sea locks, North Uist contains more water than land. My next stop is the town of Karanish. I'm hoping to learn more about life on Uist by spending a night in one of its most ancient dwellings, a stone roundhouse known as a sheiling. And after last night's disaster in the tent, I'm praying for something a little more comfortable. The official definition of a sheiling is a roughly constructed hut used for pasturing animals. Ah. No expense spared on this show. I do it for the glamour, you know. 28 pounds a day and all the haggis I can eat. The Sheeling is the home of local artist Flora MacDonald. Well, that's not the image I had projected in my mind. Doesn't that look lovely? Hello. Hello. I'm Robson Green. Robson Green, pleased to meet you. I'm Flora MacDonald. Lovely to meet you. And this is my Sheeling. This is your Sheeling, yeah. I have to say. It's not what I had in my mind when I was thinking about the Sheeling. Thought it was going to be a bit grubby. But what a lovely surprise. Well, it maybe was at one time, but I restored it. You restored it? Yes. So how old is it? It's probably 150 years old. Wow. Well, you've done a grand job. And as I'm staying here tonight, do you mind I'll have a look at Please the interior? Please do. Please do. Please come in and see. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Flora, it's like something out of a fairy tale. How funny is this place? Well, I like it too. Yes, I love it, actually. I spend quite a lot of time here. Right. I come here in the summertime, and I gather flowers, and I make drawings, and I'm a little girl. Again, like you said, it was a fairy tale. Aye. And I was thinking of my parents and my grandparents, and I was retracing their steps. I got the feel of how they lived and how the, the things they had to do and how they felt. I grew up right on the edge of the sea. My father could tie his boat, he was a lobster fisherman, to the hook of the window. 
when you got back from work. I have to tell you, I felt a bit grumpy this morning because the, the, the weather finally got to me. I was drenched this morning. Do you think it adds to the character of the people? Do you think it affects the culture in that way? Oh, yes. I definitely think it affects the character of the people because mm -hmm. they had to be very, very strong to survive in gales mm -hmm. and winds and rain and hardship. The islanders on Uist have always been hardworking and self-sufficient. In years past, it was the women and children's job to hand dye wool ready for weaving. It's another tradition Flora's keeping alive, making her quite literally a dyed-in-the-wool Hebridean. Flora, I can't help noticing all these lovely things you've got over here. What have we got here? These are all materials for making natural dyes. Ah, right. Is that a thing of yours? Oh, it's a very passionate hobby of mine. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn all the skills of my grandmother and my mother and what the people did here. So. This is called black lichen. The ladies in the U.S. and all the islands, they scraped all this off the rocks. This is the most important dye in the Hebrides at that time for making the Harris tweed. Right. If you wish to put some of the in the pot for me. And how much of that do you uh, put Just in? put half that carton in. OK, no worries. Historically, the wool used to make Harris tweed was dyed using flora and fauna, hand-picked on the islands. In this case, we're using the lichen to give the fabric a darker hue. If I dip this in the pot? Yes. You can get a variety of shades. Mm -hmm. The longer you leave it in the pot, the deeper it becomes. It's a beautiful aroma. The smell never leaves the Harris tweed jacket. Oh, it is lovely. Well, in my attempt to learn the traditional Hebridean way of life, I've so far broken a tweed loom, mistaken lavanaria for sugar kelp, and now I've turned a perfectly good piece of wool into this. That's, oh. that's not what that should be looking like at the minute, is it? Well, I think it's brilliant. That's apricot. That looks wonderful to me. Yeah. Just a few things I need to know because I'm sleeping in here tonight. One, is it haunted? No. Will I be warm? Yes. Wouldn't it be nice if it just didn't rain for once? Yes. I know I sleep well tonight. The Hebridean weather can throw what it likes at me tonight. This building will withstand anything. I'm going to sleep. For a very long time. Night, night. <laughs> that is the best night's sleep I have had in a very, very long time. I could get used to living in the shielding. It's not raining. <laughs> oh, happy day. 8 a.m. It's my last day on the Outer Hebrides. And time to get back on the road. From North Uist, it's 47 miles by bike and ferry to my final stop, the Isle of Barra. On a day like today, you really appreciate the beauty of this land. Travelling across the stunning coastal landscape of the Outer Hebrides has been an incredible adventure. It's not been plain sailing, mind. In fact, it's been exhausting. But this is the British shoreline at its wildest and most untamed. I'll definitely be coming back. There's only one more place for me to visit, the airport, to catch my flight home. I've been told it's around here somewhere, near the beach, they said. I'm joking, of course. This is the Hebrides. They do everything a bit differently around here. This is the only beach on the entire planet used regularly for scheduled flights. 
Believe it or not, people come from all over the world to take off and land on this unique runway. So this is the last thing I want to tick off on my Hebridean bucket list. I hope I'm in business class. Mind you, that will probably be the co-pilot seat. Only two scheduled flights land here a day, carrying up to 150 passengers. It's one of the quietest airports in Europe. There's a lot of relatives here. There's only about 12 people on the plane. Goodness. It's obviously a big event in these parts, the plane landing. Welcome to Barra. Falcheco Barai. It's Gaelic, you know. Didn't understand a word I was saying. I imagine Steve Wilson, the airport manager, can help. I'm sure he's a Hebridean born and bred, steeped in the native tongue of his ancestors. Hello, sir. Robson. Steve Wilson. Welcome to Sunny Barra Airport. <laughs> Barra Bezos International, as it's otherwise known. I have to say, that's not a Barra accent. <laughs> Where are you from, Steve? Uh, originally from Croydon, South London. Croydon. So what brought you to Barra? Uh, Is that nightlife? <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, some brilliant clubs up in the town. Like that. <laughs> we always used to come up on holiday and that, and then met a local girl, and that was it. Built in 1936, Barra Airport is a vital link to the mainland for these isolated Hebridean islands. It's eight hours by ferry and car from Glasgow. A flight takes little over one hour. But managing a beach runway does pose some problems. All I can see here, Steve, is a rather large beach. So where's the runway? <laughs> Good question, well presented. <laughs> the runways are dictated by the markers. So there's a marker there, that's runway 33, 29, and you've got um, 25 out there. How do you know which one to use? Well, the wind direction on the anemometer. You've also got the wind socks for a visual reference, which will dictate, because they always land into the wind. 50 knots is the maximum wind speed for the twin otter to come in which you regularly hit in the winter. And so you do get cancellations because of the wind strength. Yeah. It's just a part of island life. I'm just thinking, what are the main challenges of, of running an airport like this? You know, obviously it's not secure, so you've always got people that just think it's a beach and just walk out when the aircraft's coming, so you've got to be on your guard all the time for that. And is it true people travel from all over the planet just to come here, just to land on the beach? Yep, yeah. It's probably one of the most photographed runways in the world, I'd say. And we've probably got the most photographed baggage reclaim in the world as well, because we bus shelter. <laughs> <laughs> With a team of just eight people, Steve needs all the help he can get, so he's given me a few jobs to do. First, I'm helping Joe Gillies get the 1505 flight to Glasgow airborne. So we'll give you a signal like that. Usually the first, uh, that's the number two engine. And you go, give them the same signal back and go like that. And then it'll give you the signal for the number one engine, and it's just... Isn't that the Macarena? So, say again, he's going to give me the signal for number two engine, and you want me to go like that? You, you go like that. Uh-huh. For him to start it, and then he'll go number one engine, and I'll go number one and do that. That's it. OK. Will you stand next to me in case I get it wrong? Uh, put the headset on. That's it, number two engine. Why do they start number two engine first? Hey, what do I know? So let's just get this clear. I started that plane. Yeah, you started that plane today. Next job, baggage handling. This is another of many firsts for me. Never been allowed to pack a plane. <laughs> That's another one off your bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> that is another one off my bucket list. So, am I right in thinking this runway, it's tidal, obviously. You have to, you know, go by the tide times. It's the cleanest runway in the world. It gets washed twice a day. And am I right in thinking you've got three runways here? Yes. That means you've got more runways than Heathrow? Yes. That's incredible. I think Heathrow should take a feather out your cap. They've got a bit of catching up to do. 
And then finally, it's time for me to say farewell to the Hebrides. My pilot is Phil Pickles. Well, I'm taking off today. Everything, all the conditions in our favor. It's beautiful, as you can see. A few little bubbly clouds. It might be a little bit bouncy. If you have a good look out the window when we turn right, just looking down at the swell coming in and the color of the water here, without sounding too much like a hippie, it's like looking into the soul of the world. It's that beautiful. It really is. Could have put it better. Lovely to meet you. Pleasure. Nice Thanks very much. It's not every day you take off from a runway that's also a beach. Phil was right. This is a great way to see these magical islands. Like the weather here, the Hebridean coast is unpredictable and challenging. But it's also dramatic, spectacular, and constantly changing. Next time, from the far northwest of Britain to the southeast, I'm heading to the Essex and Suffolk coast, where I'll encounter mud. Good fun, Joel. Thank you. Looking Thank you. good. And mods. It's the reunion they said would never happen. Hey, the mods and rockers back in Clacton. <laughs>